right, we're on, we're live. Testing mic. <clears throat> Check. Show you the great presentation. Sounds good on the app. Nothing else. Okay. בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We're back here on our Wednesday night, שיעור תורה, סתם תורה ביי, where, ברוך השם, after some דברי תורה, you guys, בעזרת השם, will ask some questions, and הקדוש ברוך הוא will give us some answers, בעזרת השם. Tonight שיעור is for the רפואה שלמה, for uh, רב אפרים בן שולמית, רבנית שרה בת ענת, uh, רבנית לבנה בת שרה. אבי מורי דוד בן נסריה, אמי מורתי דוריס בת ז'ורה, and all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahid that continue to watch our shulim together with us, learn together with us, grow together with us, ברוך השם. Uh, just to give everyone a uh, update, the uh, website bhtorah.org, ברוך השם, has uh, some new features that are already on there and new ones that are coming out very soon. where we'll have uh, many uh, different questions that you guys ask me. Uh, that, Baruch uh, Hashem, we have uh, different clips for them, different answers for them. If you go to that website, you go to, there's two different search terminal, terminals there. You could ask your question, uh, and Baruch uh, Hashem, the uh, website will uh, give you some videos or even textual answers. Uh, based on all of the shirim, based on all of the Torah that we've learned together over the years, Baruch Hashem. Uh, anyone that wants to uh, uh, watch the shiur on uh, live, but not on Facebook or TikTok or anything else, you want to go to our uh, website, you go to bh.live. bh.live, you can watch our lectures live, which Be'ezlan Hashem will uh, continue growing and eventually have even more features uh, coming soon. Anyone that wants to donate to uh, help us with all the wonderful things that we're doing, you can donate on bhtorah.org, or you can donate on bezatashem.org, uh, or you can donate or get some free stuff on uh, kiruvstore.org, K-I-R-U-V, store.org, and you can get yourself a box of 20 copies of this book. It's in English and Hebrew. to distribute in your Jewish community. Baruch Hashem, we sent out dozens and dozens of boxes today. Lots of work, many more coming up as Lord Hashem. Tomorrow, we already have another shipment of books uh, on the way. And uh, Baruch Hashem, people are already coming back for seconds and thirds. Uh, those that already received got such good feedback out of it from their community that they want more. We even have a uh, school That's, uh, that got some of them, and Baruch Hashem, people are uh, enjoying the book. Uh, so with that being said, uh, we have uh, an extraordinary parasha ahead of us, uh, Parashat Kitisa, which of course is the parasha that is well known for the uh, horrific downfall of uh, Am Yisrael in, uh, you know, due to the golden calf. Uh, and uh, this is a sin that we not only Um, not only got punished for, uh, even though Hashem still loves us, even though Hashem still kept us, uh, He nearly destroyed us. Uh, but needless to say, this uh, sin is a sin that we suffer for until this day. At the same token, in this very same parasha, we learn about HaKadosh Baruch Hu's mercy. And everyone knows, or at the very least, they heard about God being merciful. So, The question begs, usually, you know, children ask this, and not just children in age, but spiritual children, people that are, you know, new to the world of Torah, new to the relationship with God, based on the Holy Torah, uh, they ask the question, if He loves us, 
then why does he punish us? I mean, Rabbi, you have all of these shirim and even films about punishment and Gehenna and Kafakela and all these horrible reincarnations into all types of stones and uh, plants and animals. If he loves us, and at the same token you're saying he's merciful, then why does he punish us? Now this is a very, very important question. It's not a childish question at all. In fact, it's one of the most fundamental questions that a Jew must always ask until he gets the answer. And if you don't have an answer, I can assure you that there is part of you that in your relationship with Hashem, in your emunah in Hashem, in your bitachon in Hashem, in your yirat shamayim, that's missing. It's easy to say, I love Hashem when everything is going good. You just got a raise at your job. You just uh, you know, launched a new business and it became a success instantly. Uh, you just uh, got married to the love of your life. You just had a kid. Of course, it's easy to love Hashem when things are going good. But what about when you got fired? What about when the customer reneged on the deal and didn't pay you the money that uh, he owed you and committed to? What about when life for lack of a better word, sucks. Do you still love God? Yeah, yeah, Rabbi, I love God. So why are you complaining? If you love God, then why are you complaining? No, it's tough times, you know, but that's why I'm, wait, but you love God. So you mean that everything that he does is good. So why are you complaining? You understand what I'm saying here? We have to find the answer. We have to find the answer. We have to find the answer. If God loves us, then why does he punish? And you can say the simple answer that you've heard me say over the years. Obviously, punishment is necessary. Just like any good parent that wants their children to be decent human beings must punish their children, HaKadosh Baruch Hu must punish us. Parents that do not punish their children Parents that do not rebuke their children should know for sure they are raising little Hitlers. That's a reality. Why? If you don't teach your kids there is right and wrong and not just no, 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 but actually punish them by sending them to the room, putting them in the corner, uh, you know, taking away things that they like, all types of things. And sometimes, believe it or not, in the politically correct world that we live in, you still got to give that kid a slap or two, if you know what I mean. Now, in my age, in, in my day, centuries ago, we didn't really get slaps. We got shoes, you know, a shoe that somehow left my, my dear mother's hand across the room and landed on us and pah! And all of a sudden you did tshuva. Today, if you do that, probably they'll arrest you, even though... It's even more necessary today than in the past. The point being is, everyone knows one of the keys to failure in our generation today, where kids are simply clueless uh, and purposeless and just causing trouble that the world has never seen before, is because of their parents' lack of discipline when they were younger. Uh, the, the kids today don't even know what discipline is. In fact, they're so used to being praised as winners, they don't even know what a loss is because when they were just a few years ago, they were competing for anything, they got a loser award or what is it called? Everyone is a winner, participation award. In so many words, a loser award. They actually got a loser award. The winner got an award, the loser got an award. So what's the difference? Why should I try hard? This unfortunately is the poison of the generation. But we're not going to fix the generation today. What we can hope for is to, at the very least, have some more tools to fix ourselves and our relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because if we love Hashem, then why do we complain? If He loves us, then why does He punish us? The answer to both is the same. And Be'ezat Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give us the tools to give us a clear answer that will bring us that missing piece of the puzzle that we so needed and didn't even realize it. Now, of course, the parasha 
is full of gems, one gem after another, but connecting the dots without Siyat Dishmai, without a Kadosh Bohu helping you, is simply impossible. You look at the storyline, you look at the mitzvot, and you're not really sure what does one thing have to do with the other, so you kind of figure, yeah, well, this is not really a history book. The Torah is not a history book, so Hashem is just telling us different things that uh, He wants us to know. But that would be wrong, because even though it is not a history book, and it's certainly not in chronological order, one parasha that could be before, could precede the second parasha, but actually the event itself could have actually been the one that was later on. So the Torah is not chronologically written, but it is written in a format that everything that is next to each other is even more connected to each other than it is connected to parts of the Torah that are further apart. Meaning there's a reason why Parashat Kitisa is next to Parashat, uh, um, Parashat Tetzaveh, there's a reason why we learn about the census before we learn about the Ktoret, before we learn about Shabbat, before we learn about the golden calf, and then killing a bunch of people that followed the horrific idolatry of the golden calf. All of them are connected, and they're much more connected than you can possibly imagine. So, with all of that being said in the introduction, in your hands, let's start working through the parasha Be'ezrat Hashem. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu, first and foremost, tells Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu, you have to do a census. What's a census? Count my dear children. Count the Jews. Count them. I want you to count them and tell me how many you got. Does Hashem not know how many Jews there are? Obviously He knows. So of course, the Pshat, the simple meaning is, is that Hashem wants us to know that we love Him and that, that He loves us and that He counts us like jewels. But at the same token, if that was the complete answer, then why didn't He count everyone? We only counted the Jews that were male between the ages of 20 and 60. We didn't count the females. We didn't count the elders. We didn't count the children, and we didn't even count the Levi tribe. So we're missing a lot. I mean, if he loves us, he wants all of us. No, no. Because the counting was not just to show that he loves us, but even more. Later on, we see that HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us the way that you have to count the Jewish people is in order to make sure that there is no Ayn you know, which is evil eye, brought upon Am Yisrael. You're not allowed to count Jews. So what do you do? You fulfill the mitzvah of machatzit shekel, which is everyone, whether rich or poor, has to give the same half a shekel coin, and you count the coins. So in today's world, when we need to count how many people are in the Bet Knesset in order to make sure we have at least 10 Jews that are observant of Shabbat, so we can actually pray together and say Kaddish together and take the Sefer Torah out, then we don't count the Jews. We either say one of the verses from the Torah or a Tehillim that has 10 words, or we count some object that everyone has, whether it's the chair they're sitting on or if they're wearing the kippah, shoes. We're counting something but not the Jew itself. Why? Because this brings Ainara. Now, as a side note, you have to know that Ainara, in essence, is something that's telling you that something contradictory to what you've probably learned in many places. Many times people give shilim about mazal. Mazal, how to change your mazal. If you type on the internet how to change your mazal, I'm sure you're going to get countless hits. Countless people have spoken about mazal as if it's a simple subject. But mazal really is much more complicated than you can possibly imagine because if Am Yisrael was not subject to mazal, number one, why are we subject to Ainara? And even more so, 
why does the Gemara in Masechet Mo'et Katan, when it talks about different people that have different mazal, where he is righteous, his mazal is better, he is wicked, his mazal is lower, but sometimes you see that this one is righteous, but he dies young because his mazal. Wait, but you said that if he's a Jew, he's above the mazal. So the Gemara Moshechet Moed Katan, the Tosfot over there comments in page 28, 28a, he says, even though HaKadosh Baruch Hu said that Am Yisrael is above the Mazal, that's generally speaking. More specifically, HaKadosh Baruch Hu could simply have Mazal as the reason of why someone will live or die, someone will be rich or poor, get married or not married, meaning that, yes, we're above the Mazal, generally speaking, subject to the small print, where, in essence, Hashem says, but not in this case. You're above the Mazal, but not in this case. You're above the Mazal, but not him. You're above the Mazal, but not her. You're above the Mazal, but not today. Meaning that Mazal generally is not something that is relevant to Am Yisrael, but rather to the Gentiles, except there are exceptions. And those exceptions are based on whether someone is uh, reincarnation and there's an account that he has to uh, to, to fulfill, uh, or there's a kapat of anot that Hashem wants to give him, or there's a test, or there is all types of other things that are in the infinite calculator that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has. In so many words, mazal, is not necessarily so simple. In fact, it's impossible to understand, which is the exact opposite of simple. So now, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Ayin HaRa is very much a real thing, and we want to make sure that we don't count the Jews that I love, and you count only specific ones, and I want you to count them in a specific way. The total comes up to a little over 600,000, which we find out later on in the Torah, but we have to ask ourselves, why do we care about this number if it's not even the real number? It's not how many Jews there were in the desert at Mount Sinai. It's a lot more than 600,000. This is just the 600,000 people that were able to be soldiers. They were capable of being soldiers because they were between the age of 20 and 60, but, and they were not a female because there's no female soldiers in the Jewish army. Uh, there were not children because no adult children in the army of, uh, of, of, of Israel. There are no uh, older people because there's no older people in the army and so, many, and so on and so forth. So why do we need to know this number, this 600,000 number? We have to answer these questions all the time. We have to answer these questions. After that, we see that HaKadosh Baruch Hu commands Moshe Rabbeinu to make a special oil. This oil that Moshe Rabbeinu made is a oil unlike any other oil that ever existed before or after. This is an oil that Moshe Rabbeinu made. HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, this oil of elevation to sanctity shall, uh, shall remain before me for your generations. And Chazal explains to us that even though these, uh, uh, the amount of 12 logs, that's the measure, biblical measurement, 12 logs of oil Moshe Rabbeinu made, was used on the Mizbeach, all over the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the different parts of the, uh, uh, the Bet HaMikdash, of the desert, if you will, uh, on the Kohanim. Uh, you know, this is something that was used for hundreds of years, all over the place, all over the place, the tabernacle had this, the Bet HaMikdash had this. I mean, this is something that was literally used massive amounts of it. But yet, for hundreds of years, the amount of oil stayed exactly the same, even though Moshe Rabbeinu only made it once and never again. And this 12 logs of oil was eventually hidden with the Aron Kodesh and the, uh, the uh, Ten Commandments and uh, uh, the staff and several other things that were hidden by Yoshayahu the king when he saw that uh, the Bet HaMikdash was going to be destroyed. So he hid these things 
and this oil will be necessary uh, for us to use when the Mashiach comes. But the point being is, is that this oil was a very, very special oil, and the Chachamim say in the, um, in the Torah that this oil was prophesied by HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in essence, he promised us that this oil will be forever for your generations. This is chapter uh, 30, verse 31. This oil will be for your generations, meaning forever. And forever is actually referring to it'll never go down in, in, in amount. No matter how much you use it. You could pour 10 gallons out of it, turn it around the bottle, say exactly the same. Literally an open miracle for hundreds of years. And one of the hints that this is what it's going to be is that when it's uh, mentioned in the Torah, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Zeli. That this uh, this will be this uh, this oil and ze is the letter of Zion and he which are the numerical value of twelve which stands for the twelve logs of quantity of oil. This special oil was extraordinarily important, but we know very little about it today because we don't read about it every day. What we do know a lot about is the ketoit. Why? Because we read it about the ketoit every single day. In our prayer, there are segments of this week's parasha in our prayer that we read every day. And in fact, reading the Ktoret uh, for a, uh, each day is an uh, extraordinary zgula for Parnasa. Uh, Rav Zavichi Shichye wrote a huge book, over 700 pages, about the different benefits of reading the Ktoret. Uh, many Chachamim actually uh, said uh, you should read it from a cloth, uh, from a, uh, a, a parchment. Uh, we got a few of them uh, for a couple of students that asked us to, uh, to get it from them from Eretz Yisrael. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that they read from instead of reading from the Sidu. And this certainly is something uh, that uh, can help. But the point is, is that this uh, Ktoret is something that we know a lot about because we read it every single day, and we know there's rules. You're not allowed to remake the Ktoret, you're not allowed to, you know, actually combine all of these things in the, in the same way that Moshe Rabbeinu did, but nonetheless, we know that the Ktoret itself has many lessons in it. Number one, the message itself is what happens from the Ktoret, it's obviously part of the servitude in the Bet HaMikdash, in the uh, uh, Bet HaMikdash of the desert, in the first and the second Bet HaMikdash, it would make smoke, the smoke would be not just regular smoke, would actually literally make a pillar of smoke that would reach all the way to the heavens and would not move right or left, even if it rained and even if there was strong wind. It was miraculously there. The Gemara in Masechet Yoma talks about the family, the lineage of family that uh, actually knew the special secrets of the Ketoret, and what made the smoke do that, aside from the, uh, the supernatural, there was also a natural way of uh, ingredients that made the smoke and made the smoke the way it was. But one of the interesting things that we also learn in the Gemara about the Ketoret is one of the ingredients. The ingredient of Chelbona was the only ingredient out of the entire 11 that not only didn't smell good, but rather this chelbona, which is uh, galbanum, this chelbona smelled horrible. Like horrible, horrible, terrible. Now, there is a Yemenite food that uh, sounds the same. I'm actually wondering if it's the same ingredient, but nonetheless, this, uh, but of course, you know, people like it, even though it smells terrible. But this particular incense uh, smelled horrible. But yet Hashem is telling us, put it in there because this is going to make a beautiful smell together, a beautiful aroma. So the Chachamim ask naturally, why do we need something that smells terrible, something that no one can bear its smell, in something that is supposed to smell good. Why have this bad smell? Why have this chalbonah? Just leave the other ingredients. 
In fact, by the way, this is still done today when people make certain uh, besamim, they put certain ingredients that smell terrible. One of the reasons is because the uh, one that smells terrible s- empowers the ones that smell good to smell even better, which overpowers the terrible smell. So by itself, it smells terrible, but together with the other ones, when it's mixed and it's a uh, together, it actually, everything smells much, much better. So that's the basic. But furthermore, the Chachamim teach us that this bad smell is also to teach us that in the world of Torah, in Am Yisrael, we have to make sure we think about the Ketoret every single day. Because the Ketoret on one hand, you see that it makes us smoke. Who looks at it? First, the Jewish people are looking at it. The Jewish people are looking at the Ketoret, they're seeing a miracle. Where even though there was a bad smell, when you made it, at the end it turned out to be something beautiful. Just like, even though sometimes we have a group of righteous people, but there's going to be one wicked person. There's going to be a wicked person, or a few wicked people among us. We need those wicked people. Why? Those wicked people, if we treat them the right way, and we try to do kiruv with them, we try to help them do tshuva, in the end, they'll strengthen us. We need the wicked people because, not because we need wicked actual people, but we need to keep them close. Because if we are truly righteous, we can turn that wicked person to become stronger, and that will ultimately make us stronger. So, first one that sees the ketoret is the Jewish people that are close. Second one that sees the ketoret are the people that they saw a few bad Jews, they got dismayed, they got upset, they, one Jew stole their money, one Jew, you know, uh, caused them problems, so they gave up, they're leaving the community. Unfortunately, this happens. People, you know, sometimes do business, and uh, one guy uh, doesn't do right by the other, and of course, the people say, ah, oh, see, if Jews are treating this way each other, that's why the, you know, there's problems. Wait, you're making it as if Jews are the only ones that steal. Jews are the only ones that are bad. Trust me when I tell you, with all the bad that uh, we do, we're still much better than everybody else. And that's a known fact, and that's even stated by Green. Needless to say, the Jews that leave, they don't ever leave and never look back. They leave for a little while, and then they look back. How far am I? They live a little bit, they look back. How far am I? The Ketoret was supposed to remind them, look, you may think that you're solving your problem by leaving the community, but look at the pillar of smoke. You think that pillar of smoke is there naturally? No, it's a miracle. You think that the nation is here naturally? No, it's a miracle. You think that the Jewish people exist 3,334 years after the world started hating them more than any other nation, naturally, no, it's a miracle. You're not here because of your, you love all Jews the same. You are here because HaKadosh Baruch Hu decreed for you to be here. So the Ketoret is supposed to, in itself, remind a person that God is the one that runs the world. Even if Jews are not necessarily always the best representation of Judaism, that should never cause you to leave God. That should never cause you to leave Judaism because Judaism is best represented by the Torah and the Gdolim that represent it, not by the regular people that sometimes misrepresent it. The third that would see the Ketoret would be the Gentiles, the Goim. They would see the Ketoret and they also, as much as they sometimes hate the Jews, as much as they sometimes say they like the Jews, they're always fascinated by the miraculous life of Am Yisrael. This is why in the Rosh Chodesh, when we read the Tehilim, we say that the Goim are supposed to praise Hashem because of all the miracles that He made to the Jews. Why should the Goim praise Hashem for the miracles He made to the Jews? Because only the Goim know how many times they try to destroy us without us even knowing and HaKadosh Baruch Hu saved us. 
And HaKadosh Baruch Hu saved us. They know how many tunnels they dug under the ground. They know how many bombs they wanted to, to launch. They know how many evil plans they had against us that God destroyed those plans. And the Jewish people never even knew those plans existed. They know how many miracles Hashem makes for us. Much more than we do. So when the Goyim look at the miracles of Am Yisrael, that in itself is supposed to create a Kiddush Hashem. Create a strengthening. For all of us, including the Goyim. And yet, Rabotai Karim, this Ktoret with specific ingredients and specific quantities where if one is missed, it's a death penalty, is in the parasha. And it includes a smelly one. But we realize we need it. We need that smelly one. We need that bad guy that's desecrating Shabbat and has a filthy mouth. We need him to stay in a community. Why? Because it gives us an opportunity to strengthen ourselves. But what is that connected to the senses? How is that connected to the next mitzvah that we learn about Shabbat? We see that there's really smart people that are gifted. The Bitzalel and Al Yav Two, both of them were young kids. Bitzalel was only 13 years old, but they were both given Ruach HaKodesh. And in fact, the uh, Chachamim uh, teach us here also that it's not just Bitzalel and Oliav, but rather anyone that was inspired to sanctify Hashem's name by building the Mishkan, by building the Bet HaMikdash of the desert, also was suddenly gifted talents that he didn't know he had. This is like sometimes a person says, listen, Rabbi, I want to help. I want to do Kiruv. Okay, what are you, what, what's your talents? What's your abilities? Well, I don't really have much. I'm not really sure. I, I just want to do it, but I don't know what I can do. Do you want to give out books? Uh, maybe. Do you want to give out USBs? Maybe. Do you want to arrange a shior? Maybe. Do you want to publicize our stuff online? Maybe. Do you want to translate videos? Maybe. Okay, so which one do you want to do? I want to do all of them, but I don't know which one. You know what? Which one does your heart connect you to? And they'll pick one. And all of a sudden, if the person is really serious and they're passionate about doing Kiruv, all of a sudden they discover a talent they never knew they had. All of a sudden, they are the best Kiruv person on planet. They're giving out hundreds of books like it's nothing. All of a sudden, they're able to arrange lectures. All of a sudden, they're able to publicize things. All of a sudden, they're able to use technology they never knew existed. All of a sudden, they're much better than they thought. Why? Because that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us here in chapter 31, in verse 14, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, not only, not only, uh, verse uh, 6, I'm sorry, uh, not only gave the gift of wisdom to Bezalel and Oliyah, but also to any wise-hearted person who rose for the task. Hashem gave him wisdom. That too is connected. It's connected to the ketoret. It's connected to the oil that never emptied. It's connected to the senses. How is it all connected? What's the connection? The fact that it's on the same parasha? That's not enough. We need more. Then HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, by the way, I know that you're going to build my mishkan, but don't allow yourself for a second to think that just because you're doing a mitzvah that allows you to make a sin as a result. When Shabbat comes, building the Mishkan is forbidden. And we learn the 39 melachot of Shabbat, the 39 restrictions of Shabbat from the building of the Bet HaMikdash. 39 things that were used to build the Bet HaMikdash are specifically forbidden to do on Shabbat. Whether it's erasing, writing, building, destroying, and so on and so forth. So Kadosh Baruch Hu tells us the Shabbat is a testament that you believe in God. The Shabbat a Jew that observes Shabbat is testifying that they believe that God runs the world. God created the world in the six days and stopped creating on the seventh. A Jew that desecrates Shabbat is in essence saying that they do not believe that God created the world. They believe that maybe Darwin created it or maybe the amoeba created it, but not God. They said, no, I believe in God, I just don't keep Shabbat. Well, according to God, you don't believe in God. Why? Because if you believe in God, you'd follow his laws. It's hard. No problem. Marriage is hard, but people still want to do it. Having kids is hard. People still want to do it. Working is hard, but people still want to do it. Why? Because they believe in the idea. 
If you believed in God, you would actually follow his laws. How is that connected? And then Rabotai Karim, we get to the reception of the Torah where Moshe Rabbeinu goes up to Shemaim. Goes up to Shemaim, Akadosh Baruch Hu gives him the Torah, but it wasn't so simple. The Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says that when Moshe Rabbeinu got up to Shemaim, the angels, which are fire, looked at him and said, what is a son of a woman doing here? Moshe Rabbeinu said, I'm here to receive the Torah. The angels roared at him, scared him. You want to receive the Torah? Torah is not for you. Torah, Torah. What makes you think that the Torah is for you? Moshe Rabbeinu was so scared, he didn't answer. So Hashem said, Moshe, answer them. Moshe said to Hashem, Hashem, I'm scared. They're going to burn me. Hashem said, hold on to my throne of glory. I'll protect you. Go answer them. Moshe Rabbeinu held on to Hashem's throne of glory and answered the angels. Clearly, the Torah is for us. From the time that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wrote it, 974 generations before he created the world and before he even created you or I, Hashem made sure that the Torah is for people. It's for the Jewish people. Because he made laws that are only to be followed by people. He said you have to observe the Shabbat. Do angels observe Shabbat? No. He said you have a mitzvah of reproducing. Poo boo. Do angels get married and reproduce? No. He said you have to eat kosher food, kosher animals. Do angels eat? Needless to say, do they eat kosher food? No. He said there's family purity. The woman would have a menstrual cycle where her husband is not allowed to touch her during that time. Not sleep in the same bed, not hold hands, not even give a hug during that whole time until she's clear of the uh, to of the month and she goes to the mikveh. Until then, they're not allowed to eat from the same plate, share cups. They're not allowed to sleep in the same bed. They have to have separate beds, although in the same room, never sleep in separate rooms. They're just separated a little bit. And then when she's pure, the beds are put together again, like a queen bed or king bed. But while she's impure, she's forbidden to her husband. Her kids can still hug her. Her sisters can still hug her and kiss her. To everybody else, she's normal. But to her husband, she's forbidden. Are angels keeping the menstrual cycle? Are angels keeping family purity? No. When the angels heard how much Moshe loves the Torah, they agreed with him and they each gave him a gift. They each gave him a gift. But the Yetzirah wasn't exactly too excited when he found out that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave the Torah to Moshe Rabbeinu. He almost lost his mind. Initially, he was looking for the Torah. He couldn't find it. He asked the heavens. They said, we don't know. He asked the moon and the sun, where's the Torah? Not sure. Nobody wanted to tell him where it is because they didn't want him to hurt Moshe Rabbeinu. He was still on his way down to earth. Yes, the mountains. Mountains didn't want to talk. Yes, the Kadosh Baruch Hu. Kadosh Baruch Hu says, Moshe. Moshe has it. Moshe, the son of Amram, he has it. He came to Moshe and he said, Moshe, you have the Torah. Moshe said, me? Have the Torah? How could I possibly have the Torah? Hashem started talking to Moshe. Moshe, Moshe, are you fibbing? Why did you become a liar? He says, no, Hashem, I'm not lying. It's the truth. You gave me the Torah, but in reality, all I'm doing is just repeating it, repeating the essence of the Torah to your people. There's no way that anyone, that needless to say that I am great enough to actually have your Torah. I'm just representing it. I'm just telling them it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, was so in love with Moshe Rabbeinu's humility. He said, Moshe, is so humble that you didn't even want to take the credit for getting the Torah. Because of that, I'm going to name the Torah after you. That's why it's called Torah Moshe, the Torah of Moshe, or the five books of Moses. 
But the Satan did not want Moshe Rabbeinu to have this Torah because he knew that that's the only weapon that could defeat him. But this, unfortunately, did not work during the time that Moshe Rabbeinu was still up in Shemaim because the Erev Rav, which were the wicked Egyptians that pretended to want to convert to Judaism, that came with Am Yisrael out of Egypt, came to Mount Sinai, these idolaters were always looking for an opportunity to bring back idol worship. We're always looking for an opportunity to take down Moshe Rabbeinu. So when Moshe Rabbeinu did not come in the exact time that people thought he was supposed to come, because of their wrong calculation, they started talking bad about it and saying he probably died. Look, he's not here. You saw how Hashem punished the Egyptians. Why? I mean, listen, Moshe Rabbeinu is a nice guy. He's great, but listen, he's gone 40 days, 40 nights. How is he eating? Where is he getting food? How is he drinking? How is he surviving in the mountain for 40 days, 40 nights? It can't be. When the Satan saw that people are starting to believe the Erev Rav, the Satan showed them a visual, an image, as if angels are carrying a, a body. And he said, look, maybe that's Moshe. And that's when the Erev Rav went to Hu, and they told her, Make us, make us a new Elohim. What's a new Elohim? Elohim can be translated as God, but also translates as master. Make us a new leader that will replace Moshe Rabbeinu. Obviously, everyone knew that God is real, but they thought that they need a middleman to connect them to God, like they do in Christianity and in Islam and other places. You don't need anyone to connect you to God. Certainly, you need to learn Torah. You need to learn from people that know something, know Torah. But if you want to pray to God, you don't need anybody to help you pray. You don't need anyone to help you pray. You can pray to God whenever you want, however you want. No one is needed to connect you to God. You can connect to God whenever you want, however you want. But the idol worshiping, Erev Rav, that are used to idolatry, they convinced everyone that if Moshe Rabbeinu is not here, then... God's not going to talk to us anymore. We need something to replace him. They went to Chul and they said, make us something. Chul said, no way. They killed him on the spot. They wanted to show everyone they mean business. They got everybody even more excited. Why? Once there's blood spilled, everyone gets crazy. They went to Aaron. Aaron knew that if he says no, or even if he hesitates, they're going to kill him on the spot. And if they kill him on the spot, there's no possibility of them doing tshuva because killing a prophet and a Kohen on the same day is in essence a destruction. So Aaron said, okay, let me do something that's going to buy me some time. Let me do something that's going to buy me some time. He says, okay, you know what? Go get me the earrings, the rings from your, from your wives, from your kids. He figured that the wives and the kids are not going to want to give him this stuff. And they, he was right. The wives didn't. But the husbands themselves, didn't care, and they started taking off their own earrings, their own bracelets, and they brought everything to Aaron. They threw it in the fire, and one of the idol worshippers named Micha, that had a mate that he stole from Moshe Rabbeinu, that had the real name of God on it, and on the other side it had a verse called Ale Shor Ale, Rise Bull Rise. This is one of the things that Moshe Rabbeinu used in order to take out the tomb of. Yosef at Sadiq from underwater, miraculously. So this little kid, Micha, threw this into the fire, and in essence, the gold all melted instantly, unified, turned into a golden calf that spoke. So Moshe Rabbeinu Rabotai Karim is up in the mountain. He's having an amazing time, to say the least learning Torah from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And then Hashem says, it's time for you to go. It's time for you to go. Why? Because your people that you took out of Egypt sinned. He's referring specifically to the Erev Rav. And Moshe Rabbeinu hears this and he doesn't want to believe it. He doesn't want to believe this happened. 
But he knows that Kadosh Baruch Hu means business. Because the Kadosh Baruch Hu says to him, after he tells him that your people that you brought out of Egypt have corrupted and they've made an idol, Hashem says, let my anger and intensity, uh, let my anger intensify against them and I shall annihilate them and make you into a new nation. Moshe Rabbeinu realizes that all of Am Yisrael is at risk of being destroyed, not just the Erev Rav. And it says in verse number 11 of chapter 22, uh, 32, Moshe prayed before Hashem as God. Why Hashem should your anger intensify against your people, whom you have taken out of the land of Egypt with great power and strong hand? Why should the Egyptians say the following, that with evil intent did he take them out, to kill them among the mountains, to annihilate them? In essence, Moshe Rabbeinu is arguing for the sake of Am Yisrael. Now, of course, HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows all of this. But he still threatens to destroy us. Later on, he still punishes us. Even though Moshe Rabbeinu comes down, destroys the Ten Commandment. After that, he takes the golden calf, crushes it, which obviously required supernatural powers there to do that, crushes it and turns it into dust, puts it into the water, then makes everybody drink it, whoever worshipped the idol directly, dies after drinking this water. After that, he tells the Levi'im, whoever is for God, meaning whoever has fear of God, come with me. Whoever has fear of God, come with me. The Levi tribe comes, because they're the only ones that didn't sin. And Moshe Rabbeinu says, any of you that saw, anybody, even if it's your brother, even if it's your son, whoever it is, you saw him worshiping an idol, go kill him. And that's what they did. 3,000 people were killed. And even after that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu still brought a plague that killed some more. But eventually, HaKadosh Baruch Hu forgave us from the complete annihilation and dispersed the punishment over many generations. The question is, Rabotai, how is all of this connected? Why do I need to learn about the census before the golden calf? Why do I need to learn about the Ketoet before the golden calf? Why is Moshe Rabbeinu giving Akadosh Baruch Hu an example of the Egyptians? Like, who cares about the Egyptians? They're gone. What do you care about the Egyptians being right, being wrong? Is Hashem here to prove something to somebody? What's the connection? And why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu love Moshe Rabbeinu so much for everything that he did, including breaking the Ten Commandments? Now, Chachamim teaches that Moshe Rabbeinu prayed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but not in the same way that you and I prayed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He talked to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but not in the same way that you and I talked to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. HaKadosh Baruch Hu loved Moshe Rabbeinu and Moshe Rabbeinu married the Shekhinah. Moshe Rabbeinu spoke to HaKadosh Baruch Hu like one fellow speaks to his friend. One fellow to another fellow. So when HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe, let me destroy them and I'll start something new from you, Moshe Rabbeinu immediately goes on a defensive for the sake of Am Yisrael. Hashem's children, not his children. It's Hashem's children. He says, Hashem, why are you going to punish them? Why? Why are you going to punish them? Golden calf? Who gave him the gold? The Gemara says, Moshe Rabbeinu says to Hashem, who gave them the gold? You gave them the gold. You gave it to them from the Egyptians. 
You gave it to them before they got uh, at Yam Suf, before the, the, the ocean was split, they found one of the treasures of Yosef at Sadiq. On top of that, you gave them even more gold. After we got to the other side of Yam Suf, the Egyptians drowned and all of their gold came out. They got the gold from there. You gave them so much gold, they got crazy over gold. They made a golden calf. In so many words, if you didn't give them the gold, they wouldn't make a golden calf. What? What? Now, if you and I say such a thing to Hashem, obviously, we have a very serious problem. But Moshe Rabbeinu had permission. Moshe Rabbeinu had permission to blame God for the golden calf. Why? Because listen to this. Moshe Rabbeinu says to Hashem, hold on a second. You want to destroy Am Yisrael? Why do you want to destroy Am Yisrael? Because the golden calf? Who did the golden calf? 3,000 people? 3,000 people did the golden calf? Didn't you just ask me to do a census and I counted just people that were between the age of 20 and 60 over 600,000. So what are you going to kill millions of us because 3,000 are Reshaim? 3,000 are idol worshippers? Is that a fair God? 3,000 are bad. You're right. But why is everybody else going to die? It's only 3,000. It's nothing. Look how many we have. Look how many we have. We have so many. Only 3,000 are bad. And if that's not enough, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu, he comes to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and he says to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you're the one that told me to make the Ketoret, right? You made the Ketoret. And the Ketoret has to be specific ingredients, 11 ingredients, and one of the ingredients is the chelbona that smells disgusting. And one of the things that you taught me here, Mount Sinai, is that it smells disgusting in order to represent, in order to represent the reshaim, the wicked people that we got to keep close by and not let them go. Don't kick them out. Don't kick out the rasha out of the community. Bring them closer. Help them do tshuva. Why? Because number one, You'll be saving one of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's children. And number two, you'll be saving yourself and strengthening yourself. And that's what the Chelbona does. It strengthens everybody else. In so many words, these Rashaim, they're wicked, they're terrible. But there's always going to be wicked people. So what, are you going to destroy us every time there's wicked people? We need to know how to deal with the wicked people. Not just go against them, help them, do tshuva, and turn them into tzaddikim. That's why you gave us the ingredients. That's why you told us that we have to have a smelly ingredient. It represents the rasha, that we got to keep closer. Why? He's going to make us stronger. And if that's not enough, if that's not enough, he says, wait, hold on a second. What's the whole purpose of this ktoret? The ktoret is for Am Yisrael to stay close. The Ketoret is for Am Yisrael that left to come back and see it's all about Hashem. The Ketoret is also about how the Goyim look at us. So how is it going to be that you're destroying us and the Goyim are going to see, oh look, he destroyed them. He destroyed them, look at that. How is that going to look? How is that going to look? It's not going to look good for you. That he destroyed your people. It's not going to look good. Why? You destroyed millions of us because 3,000 of the Shaim. That's it. Says HaKadosh Baruch Hu to Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu, I love you. <laughs> Moshe Rabbeinu, I love you. Why? You understood the whole purpose of why I did what I did. It's not that I didn't know these excuses. Obviously, Hashem is all-knowing. He knows that only 3,000 were Erev Rav. He knows that the Ketoret is what it is. He knows all of these things. But I need to have a leader lead my people that also knows why I gave it to them. Do you know why I made sure that you do the census? In order to make sure that you see that I gave you a lot of blessings. Because sometimes there's going to be wicked people and I need to punish them. 
But even though I'm going to punish them, even though I'm going to take all of his money, he has to remember, where did you get the money from in the first place? I gave you a lot of money, not because I want you to buy a Bentley and a $5 million house. I gave you a lot of money because you're wicked. And I wanted to save you. How? Because now that you have a lot of money and you're still wicked and you need to get punished. But I love you because you're my son. I love you because you're my daughter. So what am I going to do? I'm going to give you a lot of money so I can take it all away. Because now it replaces me killing you. Now I don't have to kill you for a little longer. Now it gives you another opportunity to do tshuva. In so many words, I give you the blessing in order to enable me to punish you, but not in the heaviest punishment available. In so many words, when a person gets punished, when a person has suffering, they have to look at things from the perspective of, wait a minute, look at the blessing that I got. What blessing? You just lost all your money. What blessing? You just lost a loved one. Listen and pay attention. Who gave you this punishment, Hashem? Who gave you what you just lost, Hashem? So, if you look at things from the right perspective, you would say thank you. Not, why did you do this to me? Because you understand that Hashem is trying to save you. Rav Lassi, one of the great Mezakeh Rabim in Eretz Yisrael, he lost his son, one of his sons, a few years ago. A horrific accident, drowning, but he understood this literally better than anybody else. On the, instead of crying and agonizing like any normal parent would, instead of that, he celebrated. He celebrated and glorified Hashem, thanking Hashem that he gave him this son for 21 years. He said, I'm not going to cry that Hashem took back what's his anyway after 21 years. But rather I'm going to thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu for giving me such a wonderful son for 21 years. Look at the blessing that he gave me. He gave me this wonderful gift for 21 years. How could I complain? He took it, it's his anyway. When a Kadosh Baruch Hu gave you a lot of money and he took it. When a Kadosh Baruch Hu gave you something good and he took it. When a Kadosh Baruch Hu gives you some type of punishment. If you just lost your health, if you just lost money, if you just lost your job, if you just lost something you care about. If you have a true connection with a Kadosh Baruch Hu and you truly fear him, love him, know him, and connect it to him, you would fulfill the mitzvah that Zuchan Aruch says is an obligation to bless HaKadosh Baruch Hu both for the profit and the loss, both for what you know is good and what looks bad. Why? Because it's all good. Because if HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes it, that means he gave it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu has Moshe Rabbeinu go do the census. Why? I want you to count how many wonderful neshamot, how many wonderful neshamot I brought into the people. I also want you to remember this number because later on, a few of them are gonna go off. A few of them are gonna do something bad. And I need you to remember how many good there are, not just a few bad ones. I want you to remember how much good they do, not just a few bad things. Sure there's bad, sure they need to get punished, but also remember, if I give you 3,000 that are bad, that means that I gave it to you in the first place. And they're relevant to how much? Oh, 600,000. So relative to the whole amount, nothing. I also gave you the mitzvah of the ketoret. And the ketoret has to have the rasha inside, the wicked inside, to teach you, go and help the rasha. Go and help the Rasha do tshuva. Oh, but he's not receptive. Okay, be patient. Oh, but he's a drug addict. Okay, be patient. Oh, but he doesn't want to listen. Send it again. Oh, but he doesn't like it. Send it again. Just like the marketing company for all types of products. Send it again, even if you say I don't like it. Even if you say take it off, take me off the list. What do they do? They put you on a different list. 
They put you on a different list. You say, take me off the list, they put you on five new lists. Why? They don't care if you like or don't like. They just know that you're not buying today. Maybe you'll buy tomorrow. Maybe next month. Maybe next year. You know why? Because they care about the end result. You have to look at helping your fellow Jew the same exact way. The end result, not the process that's painful of getting rejected and getting insulted. And the, No, the end result. Why? Because if he gave it to you, that means it's for you to do. And if you have difficulties that you're dealing with, don't cry and agonize over your difficulties and your miseries. Look at the blessings. If you lost something, appreciate that you had it in the first place. Appreciate that you had it in the first place. This Rabotai Karim is one of the things that connects every one of these parts of the Torah to each other. And the ultimate thing, the ultimate thing that connects them all is Moshe Rabbeinu using all of this not only to save Am Yisrael, but also to glorify HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name by showing that even what looks bad is ultimately good. And that's why the Gemara in Masechet Mu'ed Katan, page 5, says... In the name of Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, whoever appraises HaKadosh Baruch Hu's ways will merit to witness the salvation of the Holy One, blessed be He. Meaning, Rabbi Tayyikari, if you find ways to appraise, to praise HaKadosh Baruch Hu, praise Him when it's obvious that what He did is good. Praise Him when it's hidden to see what He did is good. Praise him regardless because you know what he does is ultimately the best. Praise him and you'll merit to see the ultimate salvation that is obvious to all that it is good because he is good and he does good because it's good to do good. And that is what Hashem is. With that being said, now we know how HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us the Torah but also how Kadosh Baruch Hu decided what to do with everything in our lives, whether it's our own personal stories, whether it's our own experiences, whether it's somebody else's experiences. You no longer need to ask the question of why does Hashem reward the righteous uh, and sometimes punish them. Sometimes He rewards the wicked and sometimes punishes them. That was the question Moshe Rabbeinu asked. But here we see that it's all good. Even though it's punishment, it's good. Even though it's reward, it's good. Everything is good. It's just that we don't see the whole picture. And therefore, we need this information in order to conclude that regardless of whether we see it or we don't see it, understand it or don't understand it, we must still find a way to praise HaKadosh Baruch Hu because ultimately, everything that He does is good. The best. It doesn't get better than Hashem. You find a way to praise Hashem and you'll live to see Hashem bring the salvation where praise is not even sufficient. Now you can all ask your questions which Be'ezlat Hashem will help us continue getting closer to Hashem.
if a relative dies, uh, and one is when is one sit shiva? Uh, he's kept on life. Oh, so he didn't die. Okay. So question is, if a relative where it is required for one to when is it required for one to sit shiva if the person is pronounced dead but he's still on life support and not buried? Uh, when does the period of Shiva begin? The period of Shiva does not start until the person is buried. Um, what if the deceased could be classified as a, as he rebelled against Hashem? Uh, so, okay, so as far as the halacha is, only Jews sit Shiva. Gentiles don't sit Shiva, meaning that if you're not Jewish, you don't sit Shiva. If the person that died does not sit Shiva, uh, you don't sit shiva on them uh, if they're not Jewish. Uh, but also, if the Jew acted like a non-Jew, meaning they desecrated Shabbat, they didn't keep anything, then you also do not sit shiva on them. You can if you want to, but you, generally speaking, you don't. Uh, in fact, the uh, Rambam and the Shulchan Aruch both write uh, that if a wicked uh, Jew dies, his family should wear white clothes and celebrate. Now I know, uh, you know, very few, if any, people do that in the world today, uh, but that's actually the halacha. Why? Because if somebody's an enemy of God, it's actually better for them to die than for them to stay alive and continue being an enemy of God. Uh, but uh, you know, if uh, if a person is is righteous, then certainly it's a mitzvah to sit shiva on them. Um, what if a mourner is a convert and a deceased was a non-Jew? Uh, so I just answered that. If the uh, deceased is a non-Jew, you don't sit uh, shiva on them. Uh, if it's a person, if the person is a convert to Judaism and his parents or brothers uh, or anybody that is uh, his loved one uh, dies, he does not have to sit shiva on them. He can say Kaddish if he wants uh, on, on them, uh, but uh, he doesn't have to. Um, what if there is uh, no funeral? Again, if, he, if the person is a Jew, then there's gonna be a funeral. Uh, if the person is not Jewish, then sometimes they don't have the funeral, they just you know burn the body, put it in a little can. Uh, again, either way, it's not relevant to the Shiva part because the person's not Jewish, so therefore there's no, uh, there's no, um, uh, there's no Shiva sitting on, uh, on a non-Jew. If it's a Jew that died with no funeral, I mean, what happened to the body? The body was buried. That's considered a funeral. Uh, if the body wasn't buried and burned, then obviously the, the, you know, the person was a, uh, unless it was an accident of some kind or terrorism or something like that, uh, generally there's going to be some type of funeral. Um, now, as far as if a person is uh, a Jew sitting Shiva on another Jew, that's a family member, uh, and uh, during that time, the uh, during that week, they uh, should not uh, work, uh, and they should take off uh, during that time. But again, it's a uh, assuming that the person is, uh, you know, that died, is a righteous person, is a Jew, and and so on. But if none of these things fit, then there's no there's no shiva. Uh, the low stools is uh, it's it's for a week, uh, it's for one week. But if if the person is uh, sick or in pain, uh, and it's not possible for them to sit low stools, then they don't. They don't. You don't have to you know inflict pain on yourself. Rabbi, who should I donate to? You or my local rabbi, which I've been donating to until now? Um, okay, so as far as donations, you know, the um, Torah actually tells us here in, uh, in the parasha, it's always in the parasha. So we have to find uh, beautiful things in the parasha. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, the, the mitzvah of machasit shekel. Uh, is a mitzvah where whether a person is rich or is poor, they have to give the same amount. Now, this is a specific mitzvah where everybody gives the same amount. Uh, we still 
uh, have a custom to this day to, pri to, to give the same amount before Purim. Uh, our organization has a uh, campaign each year to fulfill these mitzvot. One of them is the Machatzit Shekel, another one is the Matanot Le'avyuni, which is helping the poor. But the, the problem that some people have is that they think that this mitzvah is all year round, meaning that everyone should give the same amount, you know, whether they're rich or poor, all year round. And the problem with that is that if, let's say, somebody is an average person, they make an average amount of money, and they give, let's say, I don't know, $50, $100, but you, uh, you know, live in a million-dollar house, and you're also giving $100, you have a very, very serious problem. Uh, you have a very serious problem that, uh, you know, you're going to get punished for the tzedakah that you gave because it wasn't sufficient. Many times people don't give as much as they think they give. So it, uh, just a food for thought, a person should know that the amount of money that they give usually will answer many of the questions as far as who should, they should give to because usually it can open up the ability to give to more than one place. The amount that a person should give is at least 10% of their income. And if a person says, yeah, but I don't have an income, fine, you may not have an income, but you know, if you live in a million dollar house or two million dollar house, obviously there is, you have assets. You still need to give a substantial amount on a regular basis because that's why Hashem gave you money. Uh, now, if a person has a uh, addiction to money and uh, it's hard for them to part ways with their money, it's like one of these people that you know, doesn't want to go to the bathroom because they don't want to buy food again, then that's a sickness. And in that particular case, what they should do is they, if they want to fix that, the Rambam says they should take a small amount of money they're willing to part ways with, let's say a dollar, and give a dollar every single day to somebody. And then perhaps if they could give $10 to 10 different people every day, and then $100 to 100 different people every single day, after a while, they'll start liking to give. Now, that's also solving the stinginess problem. Now, if a person is not stingy, which again, I don't know if this person is stingy or not stingy, I'm just trying to give an all-encompassing answer like we usually do, Baruch Hashem. Now, if a person is not stingy, and they have, you know, they, they, uh, they give ma'asel, let's say, but they want to decide, do they give ma'asel to, let's say, our organization, or they give ma'asel to their local rabbi? Who are they responsible for? The answer is, who affects your life more? Not... Who gives you more recognition? Who gives you a hug every week? Who gives you a high five? Who affected your life more until this point? If you are attending synagogue every day and the rabbi is there praying with you, but that's pretty much where it ends. You just pray with him. Uh, but the bulk of your Torah, your questions, the shulim that you listen to is coming from myself or from somebody else, then of course your ma'asel needs to go to the place that you learn most of your Torah. It's foolish to think that you need to give your money to the local synagogue just because they're local to you, but the ones that have transformed your life, caused you to do tshuva, caused you, you know, helped you convert, helped you uh, get married, helped you with, uh, with uh, life in general, they, uh, because they're far away from you, they don't, uh, they don't get anything, but you get everything from them. You don't stop asking them questions. You don't stop asking them for favors. You don't stop watching their lectures, but you're giving all of the money to somebody else. This, unfortunately, is a form of spiritual stupidity that I find uh, a little bit frustrating, not because I think that there's any money missing. I know that whatever is ours, a Kadosh Baruch Hu will send us, but rather because I see people being decent people, but yet they don't have like com enough common sense to do the, the math. And it's happened multiple times where people ask me, what do you think about this organization that I'm donating to? Should I continue? Now, aside from the fact that this is really, you know, inappropriate to ask, uh, it's just not, a, it's not the right question. Uh, but aside from that, if I'm the one you're asking all your questions from, if I'm the one that you're learning all the lectures from, if I'm the one that you, I'm so-called rabbi, but yet you're donating somewhere else, then how do you make sense of that? How do you make sense of that, that, you know, you're getting everything, but you're giving nothing, and you're giving somewhere else that's not really giving you anything. So how does somebody make sense of that? I don't know. It's a form of spiritual stupidity. And it's important for a person to do tshuva for that. Why? Because 
Uh, Rabbi Nachman of Breslev says that if a person wastes their money on tzedakah that's inappropriate, meaning he gives tzedakah to the wrong places, it's a form of wasting seed, meaning he'll get punished for that tzedakah. So if you're giving your money to bad places, you'll actually get punished for it. Now again, I don't want anyone to give me money or think they're giving me money at all. You're giving to the organization. But it's important for a person to have some, a little bit of, of, of analysis of who they're giving to and why they're giving it. If you're just giving it because every time you give, you get a special recognition, everyone tells you, wow, look at Joey, he gave a lot of money to the synagogue and, and that's why you're giving, then you'll get punished for that staka. Why? Because you're getting kavod for it, you're not, you're not actually doing it staka. If you're giving because you feel bad because they're the local ones and they keep bothering you, that's also not the, not the right reason to give staka. If you're giving staka because, uh, you know, you feel like you're obligated just because they live next to you, then you're simply wrong. You have to give staka to the places that impact you the most. The ones that impact you the most, needless to say, the places that help you the most. You know, so if you have a, a, a rabbi or an organization or a kolel or whatever thing that you have that impacts you the most, that's where the bulk of your tzedakah should go. Now, can you give to other places? Sure but only a small part of it should go to other places. The bulk should go to the place where you're most affected by. So if you have, let's say, I don't know, you're one of these people that has, uh, uh, you watch rabbis like, uh, like a Rolodex. You have five, 10, 20 of them every single day. Most likely you're going to give to, uh, you know, to uh, a couple of them uh, more than others. But uh, you're uh, usually, you're not going to be connected to one over the others because you're all over the place. You're also not going to advance much uh, Torah-wise because you're listening to too many different shito, too many different uh, 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 ways of teaching, too many different opinions, too many different uh, things. It's more uh, appropriate to minimize that to usually just you know one or two rabbis. But either way, regardless of where or uh, how many uh, places you get impacted from, the bulk of what uh, Hashem gives you, you should give to a place that impacts you the most. Uh, and uh, the smaller amount you give to other places. And if a person finds themselves in a, in a situation where they're giving money, but they don't really see any blessing, meaning they're giving money, uh, but they see themselves losing more money, they see themselves having more difficulty in their business, they see themselves having more difficulties in life, that means there's something wrong with the place that you're giving it to. And I've said this more than once over the years. If you give to our organization, but you're seeing yourself lose money, you're seeing yourself have more problems, you're seeing pretty much your whole life go upside down, especially when it comes to money, you're not seeing any, any uh, success in regards to money, and that's over an extended period of time, there's something wrong. You should give somewhere else. But if you're seeing that uh, you're giving somewhere else uh, and you're not getting a blessing, you should question, why are you giving to this place? What are they actually doing with the money? Some people give money to places just because they, uh, you know, they like, uh, I don't know, a few videos or they like a person. But you should also ask yourself, what did they actually do with the money? Is it just for them to live off of? Is it something for them to uh, publicize more Torah? It, what is it really being used for? Again, there's no problem with a, uh, people living off of the money you donate to them. It's not, it's not a sin. Obviously, everybody needs to eat. The question is, where can you maximize your dollars? If there's a place to where they can both live off of it and also publicize more Torah, certainly that's better than if somebody's only living off of it and no matter how much he gets, he's just taking everything to his pocket. Secondly, you should also see how it impacts your life. I know that the vast majority of the people that have, uh, that have close communication with, that have donated to us on an uh, extended period of time, have seen an enormous amount of blessing. In fact, a few stories where people that uh, stopped donating and then come back a year later saying that they lost a lot uh, after they stopped donating. But, you know, there's, you can't, you know, there's nothing you can do. Uh, so many times... Uh, a person uh, gets messages from Hashem, but they're not paying attention. You know, they're not paying attention. So it's important for a person to use their, uh, the, the wisdom and the common sense that Hashem gave them to know uh, who to give to. Uh, and even more so, a person, needs to, uh, a person needs to know 
that if they are giving to the right place, then Hashem will give them blessings over time. It's not right away. It's not something that happens in uh, five seconds. It's uh, certainly something that uh, can take time, but ultimately there should be blessings that come your way uh, because it's a, uh, there's a rule in the Torah of schar mitzvah mitzvah, which is the reward for one mitzvah is another mitzvah, meaning that if a person uh, does a uh, mitzvah, Hashem gives him the ability to do another mitzvah, which is that if you give money to publicize Torah, then Hashem will give you more money to publicize Torah again. Uh, so uh, if you're not seeing that play out, there's usually something wrong with your uh, tzedakah. And if it's not something wrong with your tzedakah, then there's usually something wrong with your uh, the way you make money. Usually it's, the, you know, the latter one is first, meaning there's usually something wrong with the way you make money. But if you know that your business is kosher, then there's certainly something wrong with the place that you're giving tzedakah to. It's uh, apparently Hashem does not want it uh, to happen. And we've had this happen also. I've seen it in my own hands. It's not just that I see it on people. I've seen it myself where I've had certain uh, uh, partnerships with uh, people in the world of Torah where I saw that, you know, we're investing a lot into it, but we're not really seeing the blessing. We're not really seeing things uh, play out. And, uh, and we, after a while, we give everybody a chance. We give everybody some time. And after we just don't see things play out and, and work out after a while, we cut, uh, we cut ties. That's it. You know, we say, listen, thank you very much. We appreciate it. But the money that we're investing to publicize to why is hectic. It's like, uh, it's like uh, sacrifices brought to the Bet HaMikdash. We can't just splurge it and just throw it wherever. We have to be very careful with things. If we're not seeing a blessing as a result, if we're not seeing results as a result of us uh, investing in whether it's the kolel or it's this book or it's this whatever it is to publicize more to life, we're not seeing results that uh, are going to you know, make Hashem's name even greater. You know, we have no, uh, no qualms about uh, ending it. Now, we're not expecting results in one day or one month or even two months. Usually we give things about a year, sometimes longer, a couple of years. Uh, but certainly we expect results. We handle uh, everything that we do uh, like a business. Everything is like a business. Even though it's all holy, even though it's holy people, even though it's great people, it has to be done like a business. Why? Because, again, people are giving us uh, money to help people. People are giving us money to publicize more to love. People are giving us money to do all of these things. In essence, on their behalf, we have to make sure that we are responsible, uh, you know, messengers. We're, uh, and, and we can't just uh, throw money around for no reason. So it's certainly something that I've seen. I've seen certain things turn out to be huge blessings, Baruch Hashem. And some things just end up being, uh, you know, just nothing, nothing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, so it's something that happens. And that's why you have to evaluate uh, your... Uh, your tzedakah, no different than you evaluate your investment portfolio uh, of stocks or real estate or whatever it is that people invest in. But uh, as far as the uh, who to give, what to give, like I said before, it's uh, generally speaking, it's the place that impacts you the most. Last but not least on tzedakah, many people think that uh, the most that you're allowed to give is 20% of your income. This is incorrect. This is incorrect. 10% of your income is the ma'asev. That the Gaumi Vilna says, if you give 10% of your income to publicize Torah, Hashem will protect your money, you won't lose it. If you give chomesh, which is 20% of your income, then Hashem will guarantee you that you'll become rich whenever you decide you'll become rich, but certainly you'll become rich during your lifetime, not five minutes before you die. So that is chomesh. But of course, it all comes with tests. Giving 20% of your income is not easy for most people. But the... 20% is not a cap. It's not the most. It's not the most. Like some people say, oh no, but the sages said don't give more than 20%. No. What they're referring to is don't give more than 20% for the sake of helping the poor, for the sake of helping the uh, needy. But if it's for the sake of publicizing Torah, there is no limit. There's no limit of how much you can give for the sake of Torah. You can give 100% if you want. You can give 90%. If you're extremely wealthy, you should be giving 90%. Meaning a person that has $100 million dollars and they give $10 million, that's not really uh, uh, enough. Why? You don't need $90 million to live. You don't need $90 million to live. Either way, the point is, is that uh, the, the, the cap of 20% is on everything else except Torah. Everything else except Torah. Uh, but of course, if only every single person that's part of Am Yisrael, or at the very least, even the people that are watching us uh, you know, online, 
would give 10% of their income for us to publicize our Torah, uh, I think not only would we have the yeshiva, the Bet Knesset, the Kolel, but I think we'd have even multiple locations. Uh, of course, Baruch Hashem, we're grateful for what people do give uh, and the ones that give, but I certainly know that there are some people that get a lot more from our organization than what they give, and that's something that they have to evaluate why that's the case. I don't have to evaluate it. I know that whatever Hashem wants to send us, He'll send us one way or the other. But they have to evaluate why they have that nature uh, of uh, them receiving a lot more than they're giving. Uh, because it's certainly not a uh, healthy place to be. Uh, okay, next question. Let's see. Hi, I'm Jewish, and I'm getting stronger, but what happened on October 7th is insane. How did God allow that to happen? Uh, okay, so we have many lectures about that particular topic in general. Why does Hashem uh, bring disaster? Why did He destroy the Bet HaMikdash, the first one and the second one? Why did He uh, have the Spanish Inquisition? Why did He have the, uh, you know, the Holocaust? Why did He have October uh, 7th? and many other things that the Goyim have done to us over the years. Well, the Kadosh Baruch Hu doesn't need to uh, have us explain it for them. He said it himself. In Parashat Bechukotai, in Parashat Kitavo, in Parashat Azinu, and in many other places, including this week's Parashat Kitisa, the Kadosh Baruch Hu says clearly that he rewards the righteous and he punishes the wicked. And if we're doing things that are against Hashem, not only individually, but as a nation, he will punish us. And uh, if you look at where Am Yisrael was before October 7th, before the Holocaust, before the Spanish Inquisition, before the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash, and you compare that to what Hashem says that he commands us to do, then you'll clearly understand why Hashem punished us, and in fact, you'll thank him for not punishing us even worse. Because Hashem says that a Jew has to marry another Jew. A Jew has to eat kosher. A Jew has to keep Shabbat. These are not suggestions. These are commandments from God. So when you have so many Jews, literally millions of Jews, driving on Shabbat, desecrating Shabbat, doing business on Shabbat, uh, and, and simply care less about the Shabbat, obviously this is a betrayal of their God. So why would they expect God to protect them? Even more so when you have many Jews claim that they don't even believe in God. So if you don't believe in God, why should he protect you? Uh, if you look at the people that suffered on October 7th, the vast majority of the people in the communities that were there were people that were not exactly friends of God. Many of them were enemies of God, lefty, liberal, atheists, communist mentality. And again, this is not to uh, prosecute against them and justify the evil by the Arabs. This is simply stating the fact. These are people that declared war against God. So why would they expect God to help them? Why would they expect God to protect them? Now we do see many miracles that have happened during October 7th where people that were not Torah observant, but during the moment of truth when the terrorists were banging down on their door, threatening to kill them and so on, and they said Shema Yisrael, or they committed to doing tshuva or keeping Shabbat, Literally, Hashem made endless miracles. There are many miracle stories that are publicized already of different people that literally didn't know anything about Judaism and barely knew about God, but they said Shema Yisrael, or they did a blessing, or they did something on, and literally an open miracle happened to them, and Hashem saved them from it. One of the first people that was uh, hostages that was saved, the family went public. You know, the uncle and the family went public by, you know, doing tshuva, doing a, a different mitzvot publicly. The uncle that didn't keep anything said, if my niece comes back, I'm going to keep, uh, I'm going to do tshuva and keep Shabbat. Literally, the next day, a miracle happened and uh, that hostage came home. So the point is, is that Hashem is giving us all of these different things that are happening to us that are painful, not because he benefits from our pain, but rather because we benefit from our pain by realizing that we need God. We need God because if not for God, there wouldn't be Am Yisrael, there wouldn't be a world. 
So, but when, when, when we don't realize that we need God and we betray God and we go against God, then obviously he has to remind us that this can't go on for much longer because it'll only lead to even worse disaster like the ones that have happened in the past, which were much, much worse than October 7th. So it's important for a person to know that if you want God's protection, if you want God to fulfill his part of the covenant, we have to as well, not just as individuals, but also as a nation. Because even if a person is individually doing good, but the nation as a whole is not doing good, then uh, their chas v'shalom, in the past there have been national decrees where both the righteous and the wicked were punished. The, the, the wicked were punished for their wickedness and the righteous were punished because they weren't doing enough kiruv to help other people do tshuva. So they were righteous, but limited righteous because they didn't do enough to help others. Uh, so it's important for a person to know that all of Am Yisrael are responsible for each other's, and in a sense that we are responsible to help each other get closer to Hashem, to do tshuva, to keep Shabbat, to keep uh, uh, modesty, to keep all of the all of the mitzvot. And if you're not doing that, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. Just uh, yesterday, I spoke to somebody that swears that they are religious. Swears. I mean, they they are convinced that they are religious, but apparently they don't understand the laws of modesty. They don't realize that you know. Yes, you may wear a kippah. You may go to synagogue every single day. But if uh, if your wife or children are walking around without covering their arms or legs, uh, or they're not covered enough, then they're not modest. And they're, in essence, considered even in a worse category than someone that is secular. Why? Because you're expected to know more because you are supposedly religious. But many times people don't realize that their lack of knowledge or their ignorance of the truth is actually what's bringing a lot of the suffering to their life. Your lack of clarity, your lack of uh, uh, appreciation of what your spouse does could very well lead to a divorce. Even though you didn't think anything was wrong until you realized that, yes, it's wrong, but it's too late now. Same concept with Hashem. People many times have many problems, but they don't realize they brought this upon themselves. And the same thing as a nation. If Hashem is punishing us, that's because we brought this upon ourselves, And He's punishing us for the sake of saving us. He's punishing us for the sake of saving us. Because if he wanted to destroy us, he could have destroyed us a million and a half times already, just today. He has plenty of reasons to destroy us. He's not destroying us because he's trying to save us. But sometimes he has to give us a bigger wake-up call. And October 7th was a big wake-up call, and many Jews have done tshuva as a result of it. So if you look on, a, on the spiritual account of Klal Yisrael before October 7th and after October 7th, we certainly should thank Hashem for bringing October 7th. Why? Because on a spiritual level, we definitely improved as a nation after October 7th. Certainly, we don't want people to die. But if that's what's going to take to uh, to help all of Amisai get closer to Hashem, to, to bring the uh, Kiddush Hashem, to bring the Mashiach, then certainly it's worth it. Certainly it's worth it. Uh, but uh, can we do it in a different way? Sure, we can just all do tshuva now without waiting for Hashem to, to, to bring the wrath on us. But if we don't, then, uh, and, and we're left with two choices. One, continue getting worse. Or two, something bad happens and then some, and we all get better. Then certainly it's worth it for something bad to happen. Anyone that is spiritually honest, intellectually honest, and actually cares about uh, Hashem, His Torah, and eternity will agree with everything that I just said. Anyone that's liberal and uh, you know, with the mindset of uh, those that think that this world is the end of the world, where they're all living to, to build a castle here when they barely have a bathroom in the next world, they're obviously going to disagree and uh, you know, even uh, make a, a big stink about what I just said. But needless to say, this is the truth. This is the truth. If we look at our spiritual account, both as individuals and as a nation, from before October 7th and after October 7th, Certainly, we got much better. And if what's required for that to happen was October 7th, then it was worth it for it to happen. It was worth it for it to happen. Now, if can we do it without October 7th happening? Yes, but historically speaking, usually it doesn't work. Usually, when things are really, uh, you know, Hashem brings us a lot of blessings, uh, we don't usually uh, remember to thank Him. That's why there's a verse in the book of Deuteronomy where Hashem says, after I bring you the salvation, don't forget me. If this wasn't something we constantly do, he wouldn't write this in the Torah. But this is actually in the Torah. So if we somehow give ourselves more reminders to thank Hashem, 
instead of more reminders to go to doctor's appointments, to business appointments, to uh, all types of uh, you know appointments that we have in our life, but we actually have at least a couple of appointments a day where we're going to thank Hashem, then I can promise you that uh, things will improve for us as individuals as well as a nation. Uh, because if we don't remind ourselves that Hashem is God and He's the one and we need Him, then He will. And when He reminds us, it's usually painful. As the Shem will be smart enough not to wait for the pain. Hi Rabbi, is all makeup not allowed on Shabbat or oral based makeup only forbidden? Uh, is there a thing as Shabbat makeup permitted? Uh, so there's actually a write up uh, that one of the Chachamim wrote up that uh, if you send me a message on WhatsApp, I'll send it to you. It talks about makeup that's allowed on Shabbat. Uh, in, in so many words, if it's a, uh, um, if you read that right up, you'll understand what makeup is allowed. If you're drawing on your face or, or anything like that, then it's not allowed. But uh, if someone is uh, putting powder on their face, there's no problem with that. Uh, so if there's certain makeup that is allowed, which is much less than what's allowed you know, during the week, but it's, there is makeup that is allowed. There is. What do the Chachamim teach on schizophrenia? How do they, how to cure it? Uh, well, I mean, as far as uh, schizophrenia, the Arizal said that uh, schizophrenia is a, uh, uh, many times, not just schizophrenia, people that have a, uh, you know, these uh, types of mental illnesses, it's really not because they're mentally ill, but it's rather because they have some type of, um, you know, a um, problem spiritually whether it's a dibuk that's in them or it's a, uh, some other type of spiritual problem that's causing it to be expressed that way physically. So in the time of uh, the Arizal, he would simply fix it. He would just take out the dibuk or he would you know, do whatever is necessary to do that. But there's nobody in the world that can do that anymore. Uh, now, what do you do? In so many words, someone that has some type of schizophrenia and, and it's, it depends on the, on the level, on the condition, if they're still... Uh, you know, some are worse than others, some are better than others. Uh, if someone is still coherent and they're still functional, more or less, but they have uh, schizophrenic tendencies and so on, then of course they need to pray more, they need to stay away from things that are triggering them, uh, whatever medicine is given to them, they need to, uh, you know, that's, uh, they need to take it and not try to be a hero thinking that they don't need medicine because that happened a couple of times and uh, that led to a disaster like the story in Israel that happened a few years ago where they, uh, this couple got married and they didn't tell the girl that the husband has uh, problems and uh, mental problems and uh, they got married, they had a kid and I think the kid was maybe uh, less than a year old and uh, the mother uh, saw him murder the kid for no reason and then she found out that uh, it's because he decided to stop taking his medicine. And anytime he stops taking his medicine, he loses his mind. And she never even knew he takes medicine. Uh, so this was a very, very big uh, disaster. Uh, had she known that he takes medicine for that stuff, uh, number one, she probably wouldn't have married him. And even if she would have married him, she would have made sure he continuously takes the uh, medicine and never stops. But because the parents and the Shatchan and everybody else lied to her, that led to the death. And all of them have the blood of that baby on their hands and all of the suffering that that mother has for the rest of our life, all of that goes to their account. But the point is, is that a person that has uh, medicine has to take the medicine and not try to be a hero. Uh, third, if you're given the test, that means that you have the tools to pass it. Uh, regardless of what test you have, no one has too big of a test. Hashem gives each one of us the perfect test that we can handle. If you have a big test, that's a testament that you have a big neshama that can handle that test. That's a testament that you can handle that test and you can pass it. Uh, so never think for a moment that you can't pass that test. And obviously everybody in their own level. Hashem is not expecting everyone to become Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron Akoin. What He's expecting of us is to be the best version of ourselves that we can be by following the Torah to the best of our abilities and becoming the best version of ourselves. If we have certain limitations, obviously Hashem knows because He's the one that gave us those limitations, but sometimes a person will need those limitations in order for them to do certain things. In order for them to do certain things, sometimes if a person 
uh, you know, a, uh, has a lot of money that leads them to sin. Sometimes a person is too good looking, it leads them to sin. Sometimes a person is too healthy, it leads them to sin. So sometimes Hashem gives a person sort of a uh, disability, if you will, because it's better for them. And guess what? You actually asked for it. Before you came to the world, Hashem gave you choices. Gave you choices of what you, who you would marry and uh, what you would have, whether you would have a disability, whether you won't have. And each one of us chose what we have. If you are in this world and you have a disability, that's because before you came to this world and Hashem gave you the possibilities, you chose this. Why? Because He showed you the overall account and He showed you the benefits of this one and you chose this one. In so many words, you can't blame anybody but yourself. But in reality, you have to know that if you have it, that means you can handle it. You can handle it. And it's, uh, it's certainly good for you. As far as what's the problem with tattoos... Tattoos in general, there's no problem with the tattoo. It's just a problem for a Jew to get a tattoo because the body that you have is not yours. God gave you the body to use to store your neshama, but you're not allowed to do whatever you want with this body. The body is the property of God. You are the property of God, and therefore you have to follow His law. As a Jew, you're not allowed to put tattoos on your body. Uh, if a person chooses to ignore that rule, then they're making a sin. Now, if a, uh, a Jew has a tattoo, uh, they uh, don't have to remove it once it's already on there, meaning the sin is getting the tattoo. But having the tattoo after you have it is, uh, you know, is not a sin in itself unless the tattoo is of something that is uh, connected to idolatry or it's something that is uh, creating immorality of some kind. For example, having you know, someone that's uh, not sanua, you know, on your face or something, or on some place that everyone would see. But if it's hidden, uh, then, uh, you know, and no one sees it, then it's not a problem. Uh, but if it's uh, connected to idolatry or immorality of some kind, then yes, you do have to remove it. But as far as the bigger sin, the bigger sin is getting the tattoo. Why? Because God said so. God said so. If you have a problem, you can pretty much... Uh, go and ask God to take you up to Shemaim and explain to you why he thinks is bad. Only problem is, you, once he takes you up there, he doesn't usually bring you back. So I would think twice before I ask for that. <clears throat> okay. Hi, Rabbi, does one beat, how does one beat laziness and become accustomed to living being productive rather than seeking free time. Uh, well, number one, they should know that uh, Shlomo HaMelech says that laziness leads to sin. If you're lazy, that means it means you're a wicked person. It means you're a lazy person that makes a lot of sins. And lazy people don't enter heaven. So if you desire to go to Gehenna, you desire to go to Kafakela and all the horrible places, continue being lazy. If you want to go to heaven, you have to start getting out of your own way, stop being lazy, and become more productive. Uh, now, of course, there's a certain amount of Torah that a person has to learn, and there's a certain amount of work they have to work. For whatever reason or another, I've seen a, a common denominator among people uh, that are Baalei Tshuva, where they start learning Torah, and they start deciding for themselves that they're no longer a good fit to work in their regular jobs, like they are just gonna learn Torah all day. Now, if they were real avlechim, they went to kolel and learned serious level of Torah in a kolel day and night, then sure, that's not a problem if you uh, have the emunah and the ability to do it by all means. But for a person to watch shiret Torah all day is not considered someone that should not work. You can do that and work at the same time. You know, and, and, and the reason you're not working, not because you're listening to shiret Torah, you're not working because you're lazy. And if you're lazy, you should know that you'll get punished for it. Why? Because Hashem gave you all types of things to do in this world. Uh, and you're not doing them because you just feel like you can hang out and you're justifying it by listening to Shul Torah. Shul Torah is good, but it does not mean that a person should just simply do that all day and not actually be productive. You know, many times people think that they're much more righteous than what they really are because they listen to strong speakers, but they exclude themselves from the world, so they never pretty much leave, they never go anywhere, they never do anything. Uh, and uh, in so many words, 
they, uh, they don't think that they're sinners, but they don't realize that their lifestyle in itself, because it's not productive, is itself a big sin. Is itself a big sin. So a person must be productive. If you're going to study high level of Torah in a kola and that becomes your vocation, good, go do that. If that's not your vocation, you still need to learn Torah, but you need to also be productive. You need to work. Now, a person says, well, I work. I just don't get paid for it. Well, what do you do? Oh, I fix my garden. I walk my dog. You know, I give consulting to my friends. You know, whenever they have problems, they talk to me about it. You know, isn't that work? No, it's not work. It's being lazy and justifying your laziness by keeping yourself busy with lazy things. You need to be productive means that you need to do things that produce results, i.e. money, i.e. help to your family, i.e. help to your children, i.e. a million and a half other things that you're not doing. Hanging out all day, listening to Shure Torah and, uh, and, and, and cleaning your yard and taking out the garbage is not productive. Go do something. Go do something and stop being lazy. Why? If you don't, you'll go to Genom. And I promise you, in Genom, they're not lazy. In Genom, nobody's lazy. Why? They're very, very active. If you read the book by uh, the uh, Minchat Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda Ftaya talks about different things that the Malachi Chabala do in the real world. Not a single one of them is lazy. Every one of them is very active, very productive with destruction. Destruction, laziness, unacceptable. You don't have time to be lazy. You don't have the permission to be lazy. You don't have the right to be lazy. Who do you think you are that you have so much time in this world to have the ability to be lazy? What do you think, you have 120 years? Who promised you tomorrow? Either go learn Torah nonstop, but at a high level of Torah, or live a normal life, which means learn some Torah, and be productive by being productive, not by being productive in your mind. Get a job, make some money, do something, teach, or, you know, do something, do something. Stop being a vegetable and uh, think that uh, walking your dog is, a, uh, is, is uh, something that's benefiting society. Oh no, I volunteer at the local shelter. That's not being productive, my friend. That is not being productive. What? It's nice that you're volunteering at your local shelter, but if your kids are starving and you're volunteering, guess what? You'll get punished for that. You'll get punished for that. Why? You have to feed your kids. You have to feed your kids and your volunteering is forbidden. You're not allowed to volunteer and therefore your family suffers as a result of your volunteering unless they're on board, unless they, they are, they're okay with it. If, but if your wife says, no, no more volunteering, I need you to get a job, guess what? You have to go get a job. Or else you're violating the ketubah. The ketubah says you're going to be the one as the husband, you're going to be the one that's productive and brings money to the table. If your wife agrees that she's going to be the one that brings the money, then by all means. But if not, you have to. You must go get a job. Even if she tells you, you're in kolel, you're in kolel, listen to what I'm saying to you guys. You're in kolel, you're learning all day. Your wife says, honey, we're not making enough money. The kids are starving. The last time I bought them a, a pair of shoes was five years ago. Their, uh, their shoes are like hippopotamus. They can speak pretty much. They're opening their mouth. We need food. We need you to get a regular job. Guess what? You have to go get a regular job. Why? Because that's what the ketubah says. Oh, then I'll get a divorce. Okay, so you'll get punished for being divorced for no reason. A person must utilize their time in this world effectively. You have no permission whatsoever to be a bum. No permission. Being poor, being a bum, being a loser is a choice. It's a choice. It's not something that Hashem decreed for you. But if you are productive but unsuccessful, that's a different story. Meaning, you work... You make your, you know, you have two jobs, you have one job, you learn to lie, you do whatever it is, but the bills you have, pretty much you're never ahead. You're barely surviving, no problem. You learn to lie, you're working, Hashem's happy with you. But if you barely have food to eat, but for some reason or another, you feel like it's okay for you to hang out at the garage and fix your motorcycle, maybe you'll ride it in five years from now, guess what? You and your motorcycle will be in the same chamber. Why? You have no permission to do such things. You have no permission to be lazy in this world. You came to this world to work. What does it say in the Torah? 
Book of Job. Adam la'amal yulad. A person came to this world to toil. There's no permission whatsoever to waste time. None. Zero. You must be productive. Must. Not productive? You're wicked. Wicked. Not productive by choice, I mean. If a person is sick, a person is mentally challenged, a person is disabled, or whatever it is, obviously this doesn't apply to them. But if a person has the choice and chooses to be lazy, they should know. They have a stamp on their on their uh, report in Shemaim, wicked. Wicked. Why? Because you're not utilizing your time in this world. And you say, yeah, but I don't really want to work. I want to learn Torah. Then go learn Torah in a kolel. Go to the kolel and learn Torah in a kolel. No, but I prefer to learn in my house. Okay, what are you learning? Are you learning Shas? Are you learning Poskim? Are you learning Rishonim? Uh, what are you learning? Oh, I listen to Shuret Torah. Listen, Shuret Torah, good. I give Shuret Torah. I like Shuret Torah. But to make that your vocation all day, not no chance in the world. You listen to Shulet Torah, you're productive. Shulet Torah, productive. You can't just listen to Shulet Torah all day. You listen to ten hours of Shulet Torah, thinking that you're doing your you're righteous. Absolutely not. Why? Shulet Torah, even if it's a good quality Shulet Torah, like the one you're listening to, even if you listen to a good Shulet Torah, again, this Shulet Torah by itself. Doesn't give you the permission to do this all day, every day, 24 hours a day. You have to be productive. You have to feed your kids. You have to feed your spouse. You have to feed yourself. Oh, but listen, I don't really like it. I can't find a job that I like. Uh, you know, the people at these jobs, they're wicked. Stop pretending like you're so righteous. You have to learn how to conduct yourself in the world. We don't live in Gan Eden. You have to find a way to conduct yourself in the world. If you can't find a way to conduct yourself in the world and even find a way to live peacefully with the wicked and even find a way to live peacefully with the righteous and even find a way to live peacefully by yourself and even find a way to live peacefully with your enemy, which sometimes is your wife, sometimes is your husband. If you can't find a way to, to, to live peacefully, a Torah observant life, then guess what? It's not anybody else that's the problem. You are the problem. You, 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 not them. They have their problems, but you are justifying your laziness, your lack of production, your whatever it is because of other people. In Shemaim, they're going to point at you. They're not going to point at them. Oh, yeah, you know what? What? You didn't have any money. You couldn't buy Tfilin. Why didn't you buy Tfilin? Hashem sent, you know, the, 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 the pipe that had money in it from Shemaim. He sent it, but they didn't stop. You know why? Because you didn't want to work. Because uh, you quit your job, a, a, a new job, every two weeks. Because uh, you uh, instead of uh, taking the money to go buy tefillin, you bought a new watch. You bought a fancier car. You bought five pairs of sneakers. So Hashem sent you the money. You just didn't get there to collect, or you misappropriated it somewhere else. So guess what? In Shemayim, they're not calculating you with the righteous. They're not calculating with the righteous. You have to fix that. Stop blaming the world being wicked. World has always been the same. Nothing has changed. Nothing new under the sun. The world is the same today as it was yesterday, as it was the day before. The fact that we have new technology, so what? There was technology of the older days that was uh, taking people's attention. Today, it's artificial intelligence. 20 years ago, it was the internet and phones. Uh, you know, 40 years ago, it was home computers, you know, and, 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 and uh, the Atari vision, the Atari games that started, you know, 80 years ago. It was other types of things that uh, people used. Everybody had something all the time. D nothing is new. And either way, the things that we have today were available in a different version in the past, whether it be the worst things like pornography or the good things like learning to run Shuga Torah. Everything was available in the past. People have always had the Yetzirah and they had the Yetzirah Tov. And there's not a single person that can go up to Shalim and say, I was wicked because of all of them and Hashem accept that. No chance. Why? Hashem gave you a Neshama, Hashem gave you a body in order for you to fight the battle yourself. And don't justify your laziness, your wickedness, your retardedness in, 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 in attending to any type of appointment on time and in, in, in getting to a job or anything else because of other people. It's you. If Hashem 
was going to put the blame on other people, he would just create them. He created you because you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility. When you're not fulfilling that responsibility, Hashem gives you just so much time. After a while, he sees that his business deal with you is not working out. You're not fulfilling, you're fulfilling your responsibility. He can simply take you out of the world. Why? It's not beneficial for you to live. As long as Hashem sees that there is a possibility that you will do tshuva in your lifetime, he gives you more time to live. The second that a person is so far removed from the ability to do tshuva, Hashem could easily pluck him out of the world even before his time. Meaning, even if he was destined to live 70 years, 100 years, but if he does certain things that show that he is not going to do tshuva anytime soon, even if he's 25 years old, 45 years old, Hashem can pluck him out of the world. You want a source for that? Go read all Israel, Rabbi Islami Salat has a whole write-up about it. So it's important for a person to know laziness is a sin. Laziness is a sin. No different than eating pig, no different than gossip, no different than other sins. It's a sin. You're not allowed to be lazy. Needless to say, if, if you have uh, somebody complaining about your laziness and you're causing, your laziness is causing others problems. But laziness, completely despicable and disgusting behavior. That's the way you should look at laziness. How's that for an answer for lazy people? Stop being lazy. Is it kosher to rob my grandfather's tefillin? Uh, I mean, if your grandfather had kosher tefillin, then sure, there's no problem of you wrapping tefillin of your grandfather. But if you don't know, then I would say go get them checked. Get them checked. It usually takes uh, a week, two weeks, depends on who the sofer is and how busy he is. Uh, it costs a little bit of money, and he, uh, he checks it for you. And uh, he tells you if it's kosher feeling, if it's not kosher feeling, sometimes you can fix it. Other times it's not worth it to fix it, you just buy new ones. But uh, as far as, is it allowed? Sure, it's allowed if they're kosher feeling. It doesn't matter who owned it feeling. If it's your grandfather, I'm sure it has sentimental value to you. But if it's not kosher feeling, it could have sentimental value, but it's not going to be mitzvah value. It's not going to be mitzvah value. You need mitzvah value. Mitzvah value is what we need in this world. Jobs in California do not want to give you time off for early Shabbos. Okay, so you have a job and they do not want to give you time off to go keep Shabbat. What does the Torah say? The Torah says, quit the job. Quit the job. Now you can do what I've recommended for people many times in the past. I had a guy... Uh, maybe 10 years ago, it was a student of mine, uh, and uh, he worked for AT&T. And uh, his manager was a real, you know, tough cookie. And his manager refused to let him keep Shabbat. When he started coming to my shulim, he started realizing he has to keep Shabbat. But his problem was that the manager would always give him work on Shabbat. And uh, on Saturday itself, and he would, every time he would ask for it off, you tell him, listen, I don't have a replacement for you. You have this, uh, you have this job. Uh, so I told him, tell him you're not coming. So he told him, I'm not coming. And the boss said, if you don't come, I'm going to fire you. So he was afraid. He asked me, what do I do? I said, don't go. Who are you afraid of, Hashem or the boss? And I know, logically speaking, you're afraid he's going to fire you. Then you're not going to have food to eat. But if Hashem gave you food yesterday, he gave you food today, then... Why do you think he's not going to give you food if you're following his laws of keeping Shabbat? So he actually had the courage to do it and he didn't show up to work. At the end of Shabbat, he uh, saw that his uh, phone rang uh, a bunch of times. He checked his messages and the boss called him a bunch of times. So the next day he, uh, he goes to work and uh, the boss says, where were you? He said, I told you I'm not coming, it's Shabbat. The boss looked at him, the manager looked at him, he goes, listen, I told you, none of that, don't ever pull that on me again. And he told him, no, no, I'm doing it every week. He goes, you do it again, I'm firing you. No problem. The next week he did it again. At the end of Shabbat, he got some missed messages, but less than last week. The next day he came to work, 
The boss didn't even talk to him. He thought he's going to fired it all, for sure. The next week, he took Shabbat off again. End of Shabbat, no calls. So he figured, for now, for sure I'm fired. Goes to work the next day, everything is as usual. Everything is usual. And he kept doing this for months, three, four months like this. Three, four months like this, everything was good. Everything worked out. Eventually, he got some blessings, ended up opening up his own business. Meaning, not only did he end up keeping Shabbat, he ended up making some money in some other ways and got enough money to start his own business to make a lot more money. No one ever loses by following the Torah. So if your job says, I'm not going to let you keep Shabbat, you tell them, I'm going to keep Shabbat whether you like it or not. If they threaten to fire you, no problem. No problem. If you uh, live in, uh, in, uh, in America, you could probably sue them for it. But I wouldn't, even be- I wouldn't even bet on the fact that you could sue them. I would bet on the fact that Hashem is going to help you. Just like I told another person the other day that told me that their uh, boss is giving them problems, threatening to fire them. And uh, I told her, listen, if Hashem is giving you problems in your job that you've been in for five, ten years, and you've been threatened to be fired, why do you think it's a curse? Maybe it's Hashem wants you to make more money. Because how can I make more money if, I, uh, you know, if I'm going to get fired? No, you're not going to make more money from what you think. You think you're going to make more money from the same job. No, Hashem wants you to leave this job. But since you've been at this job for so many years, you're not even thinking about leaving this job. So what is he doing? He's causing this boss of yours to kick you out or make you miserable so you leave. Because, and now you have no choice but to look for another job. And that's the job Hashem wants you to work on that's going to make you more money. Oh, thank you, Rabbi, for making me feel better. I'm not trying to make you feel better. I'm telling you that's what the truth is. Today, literally a half hour before we started the shield, she sends me a message. Rabbi, everything you said was right. I just got offered a job with a like a remote in a different location with more money. I'm not a prophet. That's how Kadosh Baruch Hu runs the world. He tells us in the Torah. No one ever loses by following Hashem. No one. It doesn't work. Hashem runs the world, not your boss, not your customers, not your product, not you, not your mind, not your idea. Hashem runs the world. You believe in Hashem, you'll succeed. You don't believe in Hashem, Hashem will, have, Hashem will have mercy on you and hopefully force you to believe in Him. Let's see, we'll take one uh, question more. It's getting a little late. Is there any type of non-Jewish music that is allowed? Uh, yeah, you could listen to instrumentals. Instrumentals... Uh, music without lyrics, in so many words. You can listen to music without lyrics, no problem. Ideally, it would be calm music, but I know some people like the little jumpy music, like techno and stuff like that. If it has no lyrics, it does, technically there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, you're allowed to listen to it, but uh, ideally it would be something that's not aggressive and not causing you to you know, want to hurt, harm people or yourself. Uh, but uh, lyrics are usually the problem in music, not the music itself. What if we don't deserve it or we don't or to get what we want? I know we have to work on our midot, the mitzvot, and the dirot, but how can I have 100% emunah if I'm certain that I don't deserve to be? Well, as far as deserve or not deserve, you're not the judge of the world. Uh, Hashem will decide what to give you and what not to give you. As we saw from the Torah, this week's parasha, that Hashem has mercy on us to the extent where He will give us different things, even though He knows He's going to punish us. Why? If He knows that somebody uh, deserves a death penalty, but Hashem doesn't want to kill him, He can't just change the Torah, because the Torah is truth. So what does He do? He'll give him something that He can then take away in order to replace the death penalty. He'll give him money, He'll give him all types of things that he can then take away that will cause him suffering and uh, to replace that punishment. Point is that whether you deserve or you don't deserve, only Hashem decides. What you have to do is follow what the Torah says to the best of your abilities. Every day get better. And what Hashem gives you, say thank you. Baruch Hashem. And Be'ezat Hashem, you continue getting better and publicizing Hashem's name. 
Okay, Rabotai, I have to go. I actually have a, a something that, uh, an appointment <laughs> in uh, about uh, a little bit, so I have to go now. Uh, but we learned for over two hours, Baruch Hashem. Anyone that wants to support our organization to help us uh, do all the wonderful things that the organization is doing, you could donate on our website, bezadashem.org, or you could donate on bhtorah.org, or you could donate on YouTube, becoming one of these uh, subs- paid subscribers, or on Facebook, you could send a check for a million dollars, whatever you want to do. If you want to help us, you can. If you don't want to help us, but you still want to learn with us, you're still welcome to do so. Learn with us, bezadashem, one day we will all do tshuva. Kotu, Bachabas, Lacha, Shabbat Shalom to everybody, and Bezat Hashem, we will learn again next week. Kotu.